Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell, representing the 13th District, and this is my 64th Councilmember in your corner. We went virtually a couple of months ago because of the pandemic, uh, so we learned to adapt. Uh, and that really is, um, I think, one of the themes of today's Councilmember in your corner because it's all about the Los Angeles River. Uh, I couldn't be more excited uh, with uh, what is happening at the river and with the team that is assembled across the private and public sector uh, to make good things happen at the river. And that's what today is going to be about. Now, the river in the 13th district passes specifically uh, through two communities that are, are directly river adjacent that I represent, uh, Elysian Valley and Atwater Village. But they also pass through Glassell Park and Silver Lake, uh, but uh, less so, more directly impacted by the river. But the river is a resource for everyone. And that's what we'll talk about today as well. Now, um, since taking office back in 2013, my office has championed many projects and initiatives to improve the environment and the, the quality of life along the Los Angeles River for people who live near it and for, for people who visit it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, with these council members in your corner in the Genesis. Let me start with that. So uh, back in 2013, we, I began going door to door every month with my team uh, to neighborhoods that had been historically neglected in my view. So I wanted to bring city hall and government to their door. And I was so blessed to be elected to the Los Angeles City Council. I wanted to make sure and take something to people's doorstep because what I had done through the campaign was ask them for something. I asked for their vote. So my commitment to my constituents is, okay, let me offer you something that is available to everyone uh, and that you're already paying for, and that is city services. So we've done it every month practically uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, middle of 2013, and uh, now we take it virtually, as I mentioned. Um, I'm going to highlight a few things, and then we're going to talk about uh, some of the incredible guests that we have here uh, today. I'm going to make sure that my notes are in order. I'm not convinced they are, but uh, I think we're going to talk, number one, about the levee repairs, right? We're good? Okay, we'll just stay with this, Tony. Thank you. So um, following the heavy rains, a segment of the LA River's eastern levee between Regali Avenue and Los Feliz Boulevard became damaged, endangering the levee's structural integrity. And here's a picture of some of the work uh, that was done to repair that. Uh, the damage occurred to the levee's toe, uh, and that's where the levee meets the ground. Through 2017, as you can see in this photo, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers completed repair work to ensure that the levee could function as designed during a storm event. Now we know that back in the 30s through the 50s, the river was channelized because of these epic floods that would happen. Now in Elysian Valley and Atwater Village especially, there are residential areas that during uh, heavy rains are actually lower grade than the river flow. So the levees are of critical life-saving importance which is why we want to make sure that they stay intact and engineeringly uh, sound. Uh, so in order to do the repair work, a limited portion of the channel was dewatered and rerouted uh, with K-Rail. And I'm sure many of you saw this over the months back in 2017. Uh, though some vegetation and sediment was also removed to facilitate the, the process, but the area has since been replenished. The work was completed toward the end of 2017 in time for that year's future uh, storm seasons. Um, so during our rainy seasons, we are reminded of the river's strength and the need to create an efficient flow of water. In 2018, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers completed the removal of sediment and invasive vegetation from south of the two freeway to Fletcher Drive, where there is a bend in the river, as you can see in the map. This work results in better water flow during storm events and reduces the threat of flooding. If viewers would like uh, to learn more about the Army Corps' work to prevent flooding, there will be a virtual workshop next Thursday, November 5th at 6 p.m. We're going to have more information uh, uh, on the comments section of this live broadcast. 
another highlight is the North Atwater East Bank Riverway Project. This next project is very exciting and furthers our shared goal of connecting our LA River communities. The goal along the river, way back when one of my predecessors, Councilmember Ed Reyes, chaired the Ad Hoc River Committee back in 2002, was to increase connectivity all up and down the 31 plus miles of the LA River that runs through the city of Los Angeles. So connectivity is, is really what it's all about in our approach. The Atwater Village Neighborhood Council's River Committee in partnership with the National Park Service, the Bureau of Engineering, and Council District 13 received a $2.2 million grant from the state's California Natural Resources Agency for the North Atwater East Bank Riverway Project, which you see the images here. As you can see in the rendering, the project will transform a 2.2 mile dilapidated stretch of asphalt service road between Doran Street and Los Feliz Boulevard into a clearly marked and Los, uh, a clearly marked multi-use accessible trail with decomposed granite, uh, California native plants, recycled materials, local artwork, and gabion walls. The walls will provide niches for small-scale habitats to thrive from lizards to pollinating insects like butterflies. The walkway will create improved connectivity to the river for adjacent residents, pedestrians, cyclists, joggers, and equestrians. The project is currently in its planning and design phase with construction anticipated in April of next year. If you'd like to help shape the project, please complete a survey at the North Atwater East Bank Riverways website. We'll also list that in the link in the comment sections below. So this is really a great way for the community to get involved. You know, it's always a partnership. It's a partnership between elected officials, city officials, state and government officials, and local residents. Uh, and I always say this, no one can make things happen without a partnership. And it's the volunteer corps of the city of Los Angeles that are the fuel to make good things happen in our neighborhoods. And you're gonna hear a little more about that too with our, some of our guests today. Um, I wanna turn our attention to the Council District 13 clean team. Since the beginning of my first term in office, I have funded cleaning crews throughout the district. Several years ago, I enhanced my clean team to also focus specifically on the LA River. The crew was out in the district daily clearing trash, debris, and overgrown vegetation from our streets and sidewalks. This week, the clean team completed a beautification project along the LA River shared path uh, in, in Elysian Valley between Alessandro Street and Marsh Street. And so there is the clean team uh, after having done some great work along that stretch. I really wanna thank the clean team for their continued collaboration and you can always see their work on the posts that we provide on social media. I have always thought of the river as an anchor for a more broad focus on the overall environment. Removing trash pollution, cleaning the water, removing invasive species, installing LED lighting, building green spaces, restoring the habitat, supporting adaptive reuse projects, and working with and supporting groups like Friends of the Los Angeles River or River LA have practical implications across the whole city of Los Angeles. You can count on me to lead the way on environmental priorities, including expediting our transition to 100% renewable energy with my work on the Energy and Environmental Justice Committee and the LA City Council. Just as a reminder here, we're gonna take questions toward the end of the program, so uh, uh, please get those questions ready. Uh, you can ask uh, your questions on the comments here on Facebook also, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, and if we can't get to all of them, we always answer them uh, on social media, the ones that we don't get to live here. Now, I invited a few of our community partners to join us today to talk about their work to improve the quality of life uh, and the environment along the Los Angeles River. Um, joining us today, we have Shirley Lau, who is uh, our engineer with the city's Bureau of Engineering, who's working on all of these fabulous bridge projects. We have Noor Malhis, Taylor Yard Bridge Project Manager from the city's Bureau of Engineering. We also have Mas Dejuri, 
uh, Assistant General Manager for the LA Sanitation and Environment Department. And then Tracy Stone, President of the Elysian Valley Arts Collective, which hosts the annual Frogtown Art Walk. Uh, also joining from my staff, we have uh, Marisol, I'm sorry, we have Mary Rodriguez. Uh, and Mary is my deputy, one of the most seasoned uh, workers in any council office, comes from the neighborhoods, and she's the liaison for my office for Atwater Village and Elysian Valley, and works extensively on river issues. So Mary, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so let's start with you, Mary. What should residents know about the services that we offer in our district and any special mention that you would like to make in relation to the river? And make sure you unmute. <laughs> Okay, um, now I'm on mute. Yes. Okay, <laughs> I'm not seasoned at this. Um, so I do oversee the quality of life um, matters for Silver Lake, Atwater Village, and the LA River, uh, along with my colleague Hector Vega, who oversees Elysian Valley. Um, our district office is located in Echo Park. And while we are not currently open for walk-in visitors, you can reach us via phone at 213-207-3015, Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 p.m. Uh, and we will connect you with the appropriate staff member to uh, assist you in any way you require. Currently, we're scheduling one-on-one -on -one constituent calls and video chats by appointments. Uh, so if you need or you have questions pertaining, pertaining to your community, please contact our office and we will do our best to assist you. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And I think that I wrongly attributed you to Elysian Valley. So Mary is Silver Lake and Atwater Village and Hector Vega is Elysian Valley and Glassell Park. So between the two of them, we've got the river through the 13th district completely covered. Um, all right, so please help me welcome now Shirley Lau and Nur Malhis from LA's Bureau of Engineering which my office has worked with uh, on many infrastructure projects that are connecting our LA River communities, part of the dream team along the river. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember O'Farrell. Um, it has been a privilege for myself and the Bureau of Engineering to work on all of these bridge projects in your district that you had envisioned so long ago. Um, today, I'll just give a brief update on a few of these projects. Um, I'll start off with the North Atwater Bridge because you had mentioned that now there's a grant to improve that east bank of the Atwater area. And that's just wonderful because it will connect into the North Atwater Bridge, which um, in late May of this year, we did open it up completely. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get together to open up the bridge. However, I do hope some of you are enjoying the scenic views of the river from that area. And so that bridge is completely open. Um, next, I just want to mention the Taylor Yard Bridge. Uh, Norm Malhez, who's a project manager, he's going to do a very detailed PowerPoint presentation on that project. So I'm going to let him do that in a little bit. And uh, I do want to mention that the Red Car Pedestrian Bridge, um, we went ahead and opened that in January of this year. And it was so wonderful that we were able to get together and celebrate before the stay at home order started. So very excited and hope everyone's enjoying that bridge project. I do want to mention that that bridge won um, 2020 Outstanding Bridge Project with the American Society of Civil Engineers, the LA branch. And so we're very excited that it won an award. Um, as you all know, that project, it was envisioned by Councilmember O'Farrell, and we were so excited to implement that portion of the larger Glendale Hyperion project first. And so I do want to mention a little bit about the uh, Glendale Hyperion complex of bridges, which I have been to the community to discuss that project in, in earlier years. Um, you're probably wondering when we're going to start that larger retrofit and widening work. So we're still working with Caltrans to get, get their approval on the retrofit, specifically on the arches that are underneath the bridge structure. You know, we're trying to keep and maintain the historic nature and the architecture of the arches and the bridge. So um, it's very delicate. And so we're going to retrofit the arches from within. 
so that you can't tell that it's actually retrofitted. So unfortunately, it's, it's quite technical and challenging. And so we are getting Caltrans last approval on that. After we get that, we will be um, wrapping up the design and getting that to construction, hopefully uh, late 2021. I will be coming back to the community to discuss traffic detours and impacts and um, hearing all of, uh, you know, trying to answer your questions. And so we'll try to do that next year sometime. Um, and so that's pretty much all I have. And so I'm gonna turn uh, the presentation to Noor Malhas, who is the project manager at Taylor Yard. I know some of you have seen that construction in Elysian Valley. So he's gonna explain to you what we're doing over there. Thank you. Thanks, Shirley. manager um, from the I'm the project manager for the Taylor Yard Bridge. I want to make sure that I'm unmuted. I'm going to go over a status update and I'm also going to go over a presentation for people who are not familiar with the bridge um, just from the beginning. So the proposed bridge will construct um, is a multimodal bridge over LA River which connects the Legion Valley on the west to Taylor Yard and Cypress Park on the east. It would be designed for bicycle and pedestrian use would also support emergency vehicles. Some facts for the bridge is that it's a 400 foot long steel truss structure. It's 18 feet wide. Um, it's, gonna have a, it's gonna have a composite concrete deck and we're gonna have bike ramps that go up on either side of the bridge. And there's also a pier in the center of the river. Uh, the scope remove, includes removals, demolition and restoration, bridge and ramp construction, uh, landscaping and drainage, signage and striping and lighting. Uh, the contract was awarded for $18.7 million in April of 2018, or I should say June of 2018, for Ortiz, Ortiz Enterprises. And the construction start date was September of 2018, but actually they didn't start working until the river until April of 2019 due to seasonal work restrictions. And we're anticipating that the construction will be complete in the summer of 2021. Here's an overview, a location map of where the bridge is for reference over the LA River. You have here the bridge location, let me see if I zoom in a little bit. And then you have Taylor Yard here on the north side and the G2 parcel, which I think a lot of the community members are um, familiar with, where they're gonna build a potential um, park there. You have the actual state park, a magnet school, and then you have these apartments. Here's an aerial view of the same map, but just more focused in. You have the bridge location and it connects to the Los Angeles River Bikeway or the Greenway Trail. And this Greenway Trail will eventually complete be 51 miles long, all the way from the heart of the San Fernando Valley to Long Beach. And then you have this bridge here and it connects, you see where the Rio de Los Angeles State Park is. And you have this road, Kerr Road, which is also called Metrolink facility, and it'll connect to San Fernando Road. Here are some site photos of the actual location. We're standing on the east side of the river and we're looking north. Here we're standing on the east side of the river again, but now we're looking west where the, sanit where the Bureau of Sanitation Yard is. If you're familiar with that area, we're looking directly um, at the um, LA River Greenway Trail. Um, here is the actual um, location of the west side. Um, this is the, where the landing of the bridge is. It's gonna land on the actual existing bikeway path, LA River Greenway Trail. And here's a rendering of the bridge. This is gonna, what it's gonna look like when it's all complete. You're going to have the steel struct, um, truss structure, and then you're going to have these bikeway ramps um, on both sides. Over here at the apex of the bikeway ramp, it's going to be six feet. And we've also included a decorative serpentine planter, which you will see, which will be an iconic part of the bridge. And it slopes up gradually at a 2.3% slope, flattens out and goes back up again. And then it's eventually it's going to be 15 foot above the actual bikeway uh, maintenance road. And it's going to slope all the way down and cross um, to where the Taylor Yard, um, Taylor Yard project is, the Taylor Yard River Park is. Um, here's a view, another view. Um, here are some overlooks that we're constructing on either side of the main line of the bridge. This is for more aesthetic, aesthetic features for people to kind of um, just sit back and enjoy the scenery, enjoy the environment, enjoy the LA River. And there's gonna be two of them, one on either side. Here's another view of the completed bridge um, from the viewpoint of the LA River. Now we're gonna get into actual progress photos of the construction. Over here, you see false work towers. We've erected 12 false work towers and this is needed in order to even construct the superstructure. This is basically the support. So this left, this left photo that you see here 
is just the base of the false work towers. And on the right, you see the false work grillage. This is not the actual bottom core truss of the bridge. This is actually needed in order to support the superstructure. And over here, um, you see them constructing the bridge. Over here on the, the left-hand picture, you see the bottom core truss, and you also see the vertical members. Uh, they brought a lot of these pieces in off-site, and some of them were connected in parts, as you see, as you see here. You see them craning it in, and you see a man lift of them trying to put it in place. And over here is you have you have the vertical structure, the vertical members um, tying in to the horizontal um, cord structures, and then they weld them in place through um, complete joint penetration welds. So here you see um, one of the workers and the crane trying to line it in place to make that connection. Here's another photo of erection of the main line. You see them moving across. Here's a progress photo. Um, the actual uh, width of these of these members, it's gonna be 30 feet high and 27 feet wide. And on some of these next photos, I'll explain in detail, um, you know, these stainless steel cords. So once this is constructed, which is the frame of the bridge, you would have these stainless steel tension rods, which hold it in place in case that's what people were wondering. A lot of people had asked questions about these uh, long stainless steel tension rods. They're needed in order to stabilize the bridge. And here's a better photo of it looking south or west. Uh, the completed main frame of the bridge. And here's another view from the other side, but over here now you see the composite deck. Um, I was mentioning in the beginning that they're gonna build a, a deck on the bridge. So this is what they're forming right now. And it's being supported on knee braces, as you can see. And it transitions all the way from all six feet above grade, all the way to 15 feet above. And it's gonna be a good, it's a good viewpoint from those who are using it. Um, it's a very fun, it's a very fun bridge to ride your bike on and to walk on just because of the elevations. Here is a mainline view um, looking into the bridge. Um, just so you get that perspective of how large it is. And here is walking on top of the bridge where they're putting in that corrugated, that corrugated metal deck. And these are all the shear studs that are on top of it. And eventually we're going to pour concrete on top of this, and then the, the deck would be done, the superstructure would be done. Here is in the construction of the overlooks on either side. They're still, they're still moving forward on it. Today, they actually completed the final framing of that. And actually, I should go back to the other, <clears throat> this other photo. Um, right now, what they're gonna do, they have work until uh, the middle of November, the Army Corps gave an extension, and they're gonna be pouring the deck and doing some of the priming for the paint on the actual bridge structure. Uh, thank you for listening to the presentation. This is a group photo of us, including the council member, his staff, um, our staff, and the contractor, and um, some members of the contracting team. Not everyone is on the team. We have a very large team, but this is the photo that we, we have selected. And we're all social distancing here. All right, thank you. Nor, thank you. Uh, what a wonderful virtual tour of this incredible new bridge. And the literal tour that we got where that picture was taken was really amazing. You don't appreciate it until you see it in person. So I cannot wait until the summer of 21, uh, post COVID, but we'll still distance safely, uh, where, where people get to enjoy it in large numbers. It's really phenomenal. And uh, I just wanna say, uh, Shirley talked about this with the refurbishment of the Hyperion Bridge Complex. You know, when we build new bridges or refurbish old bridges, it doesn't have to just be utilitarian, right? You can take great care in the aesthetics, in the design, and you can preserve what was original and beautiful uh, circa 1927, or maybe it was, I think it was uh, post-World War I for the Hyperion Bridge. Uh, and it has historic elements that are gonna be preserved through through the renovation and make it seismically sound for you know the millions of people that cross that bridge in a several year period. So I really want to applaud our own Bureau of Engineering and also with the care that you're taking in terms of the river environment. I know that you're, you're taking into account um, some of the wildlife in the river, some of, of the, the migration that takes place with the birds and, uh, and I know that that is part of it and also uh, timing it so that the kayaking can come back as well, because all of that does get disrupted 
but the long-term benefits are really phenomenal. So again, Bureau of Engineering, thank you. Phenomenal work. And we're just uh, really proud to work alongside you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, now we have another friend uh, uh, of the Los Angeles River and on Team River for sure. Uh, Moss DeJore from LA Sanitation and the Environment, uh, who will present on their important work to monitor LA River water quality. Moss. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Council Member O'Farrell. It's always a pleasure to see you and, and talk to you. Um, LA Sanitation and Environment, uh, the Council for Watershed Health, and a few other agencies have been conducting uh, regional monitoring in the LA River since about 2008. The, the actual program is known as the LA River Watershed Monitoring Program, and it addresses two key management questions focused on public health. We do have an, a few other uh, key management questions, but those are more focused on the environment than the public health. So I wanna talk about those two questions that are focused on public health. The first one is, is it safe to swim or recreate in the LA River? And the second is, are locally caught fish safe to, safe to eat? Um, so let's go ahead with the, uh, the first question, is it safe to swim or recreate in the LA River? Um, as most people on, uh, know, swimming is prohibited in the LA River main stem. You cannot go swimming um, in the LA River. So most of our monitoring uh, for bacteria is focused on the kayaking area. Um, there's one in the Sepulveda Basin and there's another one over in the Elysian Valley. Um, I'll talk about both of those in a minute. I do wanna mention that we sample and test for bacteria in other areas of the watershed um, where the public goes swimming. For example, Handsome Dam Recreation Area and the Upper LA River Watershed. What we have found so far is that bacterial levels were elevated during the weekends and holidays. So what does that mean? It means that the, the elevated bacterial levels are probably correlated with increased presence of animals and uh, people because of the weekend and holiday people and animals end up uh, frequent the area more. Many of the areas in the upper LA River watershed, such as Switzer Falls, Gould, Gould Mesa Campground, Sturdivant Falls, and Handsome Dam Rec Lake did not exceed water quality standards for swimming. So this means that the bacterial levels are um, relatively low in those uh, swimming areas. One corollary or one subcategory of what is it safe to swim is, is it safe to kayak? And um, in the past, a uh, few years ago, about two years ago, I worked with council member O'Farrell's office to develop a testing and notification protocol for water quality in the LA River. What we found was that last year in 2019, both rec zones, both the Sepulveda Basin and Elysian Valley remained open without interruption. What this means is that the water quality was considered good, that the bacterial levels were low. Let, uh, this year in 2020, both rec zones were closed for kayaking, but not because of bacterial levels, but because of the coronavirus pandemic. But we took samples and analyzed for E. coli anyway. Again, not for public health reasons because the uh, kayaking zones were closed, but for scientific reasons. We didn't want any data gaps um, from 2008 to now. So we went ahead and proceeded with uh, testing, sampling and testing of the waters. What we found was that both rec zones would have remained open based on bacterial levels. Again, indicating that the water quality in the LA River is quite good. As a side note, I. I I actually want to mention that at the suggestion of an Elysian Valley Elementary School boy, um, we installed water quality beacons. Um, water quality beacons are essentially stop signs, um, stop lights that have a, a, a green, yellow, and red lights. Um, the green obviously signifies that the kayaking region is open and it's safe to go kayaking. The yellow signifies that the kayaking area is open, but you need to proceed with some caution. 
Um, the red obviously means that the kayaking region is closed and you should not go kayaking. The second uh, environmental, uh, the public health question is, are locally caught fish safe to eat? Um, what we do is we collect fish in uh, the LA River watershed up in the tributaries in the main stem, and we fillet the fish, and then we conduct um, analyses for metals and organic pollutants in the flesh of the fish. What we have found is that carp, bluegill, catfish, sunfish, in the LA River watershed are safe to eat as long as you keep your serving portions at eight ounces, that's a half a pound, and um, no more than three times a week. I further recommend that you eat younger fish because the probability of them having high concentrations of these pollutants is minimal. Um, because they're so young, um, they don't have time to accumulate those pollutants. I further recommend that uh, you eat the, the fillet of the fish not skin, not organs, not eggs, because if their pollution, pollutants are present, they'll be find, uh, found in those organs at higher levels. My last uh, recommendation is that you grill uh, the fish, the fillet of the fish. Uh, don't fry because the organic pollutants are found in higher concentrations in the fat and the oils. So if you fry the filet, you're essentially frying the fish um, in contaminated fats and oils. If you grill it, all that contaminated fats and oil, if the fish is contaminated, will fall down into your charcoal or the bottom of your grill. So that's, those are my recommendations. Thank you. Moss, thank you so much. And thanks, thanks for being a years long partner. Water, water quality is one of our collective priorities at the LA River. We need a higher water quality and we need to bring back the habitat so that the very, very tiny population of steelhead trout can make their way back. That's always been my North Star. When the steelhead trout starts coming back, swimming up the LA River, that will have been a, excuse the pun, but a watershed moment for the river because that'll mean the environment is coming back stronger than ever since channelization. And that is, is really the metaphor that I like to hang on to because that makes everything we do even more aspirational. And you've, you have to be inspired to want to do things like that. Um, and there's no reason in the world we can't encourage nature to come back by giving Mother Nature a helping hand. So everyone who spoke and everyone who's part of this is really uh, part of that vision. So, so I want to thank you, Moss, and Sanitation for your work. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, a constituent, uh, a world-class architect and designer, a leader in her community, uh, and someone who created this incredible yearly festival for Elysian Valley. She'll talk a little bit about it, and I worked with her all those years ago <laughs> at the very beginning of this, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our friend Tracy Stone. Well, thank you so much for having me here on your council member in the corner <laughs> broadcast to talk about the Frogtown Art Walk. Um, I'm so happy to be here to talk about our recent switch to a virtual event. And as you mentioned, I can't think of a better place to do this since the council member has been an Art Walk supporter since before he was a council member. <laughs> so you've been here from the beginning. The Frogtown Art Walk, for those of you who don't know, is a biennial event here in the Legion Valley that celebrates our community. And we were scheduled to have our 12th art walk this fall. In the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were forced to rethink the way we've done things since 2006, which was our inaugural year. And yes, I am wearing a mask. I'm here at work today with some other people, so trying to keep it all safe. Um, the decision to hold a virtual art walk this year, entitled The Art of Frogtown, rather than to simply cancel it altogether, grew out of a desire to help the arts recover a bit and start to flourish in this brave new world. The online structure allowed us to make space for a diversity of voices, highlighting those of our community and beyond, along with our young artists in new ways. We wanted to bring a sense of resilience and a little bit of joy to these trying times. Currently, the entire Art Walk is available through Facebook at Frogtown Arts. Uh, for those of you who wanna see the full spectrum of events, 
There's one video per day. It was a three-day event, very ambitious. The virtual art walk kept its focus on the relationship of Elysian Valley to the Los Angeles River, and it kicked off each day with a Tongva blessing by Tina Calderon. A quick review of some of our recent posts on Facebook will give you an idea of the scope of the festival that followed. So the, the first one I want to talk about was the Rose River Memorial Project. We were so proud to be an early partner of the Rose River Memorial Project, which is an effort to create over 200,000 red felt roses to commemorate the loss of American lives to the COVID-19 pandemic. The effort is led by public artist Marcus Lutchens and Dr. Tilly Hinton and will result in a public art installation of the roses. During the art walk, we held two workshops, one in Spanish and one in English to support this project. The next thing post I wanna talk about is our juried art show. So this year, in an effort to uh, support artists directly, who like many of us have been hit hard, particularly hard by the pandemic, we created a juried art show with a $500 grand prize and four runner up prizes along with an emerging artist prize for artists under the age of 18. We assembled a very impressive jury who reviewed all the artwork submitted for the competition and selected our winners. Congratulations to Shannon Keller, who was our grand prize winner for a piece called Night Arms, and to Moses Mills and Mia Rascone, our emerging artist winners. Our judges couldn't make a choice between them, so they awarded two of them. I then want to move to Heart Matters, which was um, a workshop created by artist Kate Walsh as one of the events you had to register for during the art walk. She led adults and kids in making postcards that will be mailed to seniors living at Kingsley Manor, which I believe is in CD 13. This assisted living facility is near and dear to us because Folar founder and poet Lewis McAdams resided here along with the 94 year old mother of our own creative writing coach, Rex Weiner. I then wanna um, show you one of the studio visits that we made to many of the artists and artisans who regularly show their work during the physical event. This year, we sent a small film crew out to various studios to interview artists and share their work during segments of the event. The art of woodworking segment featured Pat Bylard talking about his handmade percussion instruments, along with several of the other woodworking product, products he sells. The entire film sequence is punctuated by the percussive sound of several of Pat's friends, expertly playing the various drums Pat creates. Uh, I then wanna tell you about Kane Carrias, which was a first for the art walk. We caught up with this puppeteer and his puppet El Triste Kane studied under the renowned tutelage of Bob Barker. And in an extended and fascinating interview, he told us how he landed in this unlikely career, what it takes to become a puppeteer, and what the future might hold for him and El Triste. This is a really lovely in-depth interview with a very thoughtful young man, and I recommend it to everyone. I then want to turn to our dance party. We collaborated with uh, Ryan Patrick Griffin of Projected Visions uh, and created a visual dance party full of light and color and roller skaters. Um, to avoid questions about music rights, we filmed the entire party without music and provided a suggested playlist for viewers at home. Uh, then I wanna turn to Reading the River, which was one of our many um, workshops or panel discussions that we offered amongst the live streaming offerings. Um, these required registration and were offered via Zoom and the recordings are all available on Facebook and YouTube. Reading the River was organized by Rex Weiner and co-produced with Beyond Baroque and featured some really extraordinary readings of Lewis McAdams poetry by a variety of people, including family members of Lewis and friends. Uh, the next, I wanna look at a post about artist John Ching. So we reached out to artists that regularly show at the Art Walk and asked them to film themselves talking about their work in their studio settings. John Ching submitted a fascinating short video 
that included a discussion of his Hawaiian origins and his interest in documenting the vanishing species of his islands, which are home to a staggering number of the animals on the endangered species list. I hope you will uh, get a chance to uh, listen to John talk about his work. It's really quite beautiful. Uh, Finally, uh, if artists were not comfortable making their own films, we sent a small crew to their studio during the event and then quickly edited the footage and put it up within an hour or two. This was quite a feat to watch behind the scenes. Chris Rodriguez is a longtime resident and quilter who often shows at the Art Walk. She welcomed us into her studio and she actually organized a physical sale of her quilts during the event. So, this is just a, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of people, businesses, artists, and partnerships that were involved in the Art Walk and the number of amazing workshops that took place over the three-day period. We've started posting these individual segment videos so people can select the ones they're interested in. The Frogtown Art Walk was made possible by grants from the Los Angeles City Department of Cultural Affairs, the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, the California Community Foundation, and the J. Paul Getty Trust Foundation as well as from Council District 13. Thank you. Um, and the support of our amazing sponsors, The Bend, Uncommon, Dake Wilson Architects, Flawless Post, FSY Architects, Happier Camper, Keller Williams, Pacific West, Plan D Gallery, and Williams Homes. And the whole event was produced by Sherry Creative Company, a really ambitious undertaking. And we're so pleased um, to have pulled it off. <laughs> this year. Thank you for allowing me to speak about it. Tracy, congratulations. I mean, that was, uh, it started in 06, so we're 14 years in. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as you're giving this presentation, I'm thinking about the intersection of art and culture and environment. And, and really, Elysian Valley as a space is, is the, the place for that. That's where the intersection is. And uh, especially with the long tradition of artists and studios along the river and in Elysian Valley in particular. It's always been this really odd, to use an old term, mashup of artists and creatives with industrial, with uh, you know, Union Pacific employees of, from days gone by. So it's, a really, it's one of the greatest neighborhoods in Los Angeles, quite frankly. <laughs> and um, it really has come into its own, especially, I think, with this vehicle of the Frogtown Arts Walk kind of brings all of, all of those uh, components together at the same time. So thank you for creating this wonderful, wonderful uh, event. Um, all right, well, let's take some questions now. I, the panel, you're wonderful. Uh, and uh, let's see what kind of questions we might have that I can answer. All right, council member, the first question, what responsibility is the Army Corps of Engineers taking to clean up debris and litter in their jurisdiction on the Los Angeles River? That's a great question because the Los Angeles River, all the jurisdictions are super complicated. So much so that about 20 years ago, well, 18 years ago, I put together a binder uh, and investigated what sort of jurisdictional overlays were there. There are about 20 or 25 in all. Army Corps of Engineers is one. Uh, LA County Flood Control is another. You've got DWP and the list goes on and on and on. So through the 13th District, Maintenance responsibility is the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers are the ones that are authorized and tasked with cleaning debris, cleaning trash, painting out graffiti, uh, and maintaining the river through my district. Now, other parts of the river, it's the county flood control that has that responsibility. So it's super complex. Uh, but my office works with the Army Corps regularly. Now, am I always satisfied with the response we get from the Army Corps of Engineers? It's a federal, you know, agency. No, not by a long shot. But believe me, between Mary and myself, we've hounded them over the years. And I'm actually meeting with the new colonel, I think either this week or next, because the relationship has improved. Um, but stay in touch with us on what objectives you would like the Army Corps to really pay attention to, because Chances are we might be working on that with them. And it would be also great. I encourage 
constituents always to reach out to agencies that have jurisdiction over a particular area along with us. Um, so uh, that's, that's a, a long answer to a short question. Council member, our next question, will the river ever be navigable by kayak? Okay, will the river be navigable, navigable by kayak? <clears throat> At some point, I can envision a future wherein more of the river or most of the river or possibly even all of the river will be navigable by kayak. About 10 or 15 years ago, um, the feds uh, declared that the Los Angeles River was a navigable waterway. That's because during parts of the year it is because of the heavy rains. Um, and the, the grade separation between the mouth of the river, roughly in Canoga Park, to the channel at Long Beach is greater than most of the entire Mississippi River. So that gives you a sense of the geology uh, and hydrology at the river. It's intense when it's wintertime. So it is navigable. There are portions of it, as you heard earlier, that are navigable for kayaking. Someday, perhaps, more of it, maybe, maybe most of it will be. Council member, our next question pertains to homelessness along the Los Angeles River. How can we, as LA residents, help the city move forward with our shared goal of providing housing to people experiencing homelessness in a timely manner? It's another great question. So back in 04, I organized this task force and it was called the River Management and Maintenance Task Force. Mary now facilitates that task force virtually more than anything else, but we have a whole group of, of decision makers and um, workers who pull the levers to make things happen. Part of that organization is working with our homeless services providers and outreach workers, which we have gone out with more times than I can tell you along the river with outreach and offering services and then a pathway to you know a healthy life. Um, as many of you might know, I'm heavy in the production of permanent supportive housing, not just in the 13th district, but across the city. Uh, and so when you come across uh, residents who are unsheltered at the river, and if you hear that uh, someone needs assistance, let us know, because I'd be very interested on helping them get on a path to permanent housing. Now beyond that, it's a great question because it indicates you have an interest in helping with the issue. So please do get together with Mary or, or uh, Hector or someone from our office so we can add you uh, in our sort of contingency of support for housing and supportive housing uh, and even temporary shelter into permanent housing because we need it everywhere and along the river as well. I consider the people who are unhoused at the Los Angeles River, my constituents along with everyone else, uh, it just takes a little more intensive work because of the trauma that people face on the street. So thank you for your question and please do get involved with my office. Council member, our last question, is there a way to, re to reopen the LA River bike path during the construction of the Taylor Yard pedestrian bridge? Um, it, it's not possible to reopen the bike path now because of the heavy equipment that is moving back and forth and the construction work. Um, but nor I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have anything to add to that question uh, and you know partially answer it in relation to the bike path disruption due to the Elysian Valley Bridge construction? What kind of arrangements might have been made? Uh, there was a detour plan that was done um, to arrange for that when we shut down that portion of the Elysian Valley bike path. And unfortunately, we have to keep it um, closed until we finish construction. Um, once we finish the south side bridge and once we finish um, everything, we can maybe look at opening it again. Um, but just to be safe and keep the community safe, we feel it's best until there is a final project closeout. Um, we just keep it closed the way it is. We don't want people to get injured. Okay. Uh, but we do have a bike path detour that I know some people may not be too happy about, and we apologize for that. But we just think it's best to do it this way so everyone is safe. And we try to do our best to um, put all the signs there and everything ready so um, people would know where to go. And whenever project, whenever signs get defaced or removed, um, we try our best to get it back in. 
So that's the that's the consensus um, uh, with that with that topic or that issue. Okay, Nor, thank you so much. So we apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, that's always the trade-off when you're you know heavily into infrastructure projects and improvement projects. Um, but thank thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more. There's almost never enough time. But everyone who posted a question, you will get an answer to. Lastly, let me just say, please get involved with my office. The issues that we hear about, the concerns we hear about um, all the time are the concerns that we talk about in my office and work on every week. So let's, let's work together. Um, we do a lot better that way and we get more done. Uh, and then lastly, lastly, let me thank the crew here at Channel 35 for doing an incredible job always. When we mentioned that we were gonna take the council member in your corner virtual, they said, how can we help? So thank you for giving us your house for these events uh, and everyone be safe, mask up, distance. And if you haven't voted yet, vote. <laughs> there is an important election coming up on Tuesday. Stay engaged and may God bless.